My name is Escalaro, whom all of life absurds. But when I fart, I do my part and check my pants for curds. They threw me in the water to wash my old knish. I farted like a pumpkin and I killed off all the fish. Da 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 Today I want to talk about Microsoft Updates. That's right. Your old pal Eshkalar is going to feed you a little something about Microsoft Updates. The Russians got this thing that's called a hypersonic missile. They launch it at somebody and it travels five times the speed of sound, which is roughly 750 miles an hour down where we're standing. That's pretty fast. Here's an Eshkalar moment for you, kids. Ready? You see the lightning flash in the distance and you count off the seconds. One, two, three, four, boom. That lightning was four-fifths of a mile away. Yeah, because lightning, because sound tra takes five seconds to travel a mile. So you see the flash, it takes five seconds, that lightning was a mile away. You see the flash, it takes 20 seconds. How many miles? Yeah, see what I mean? So that's to give you an idea of how fast sound is at our level, around sea level. We're a little higher than that. I'm a little higher than you are because <laughs> it's my thing. But still, a hypersonic missile travels five times that fast. Think about it, five times that fast. So you see the flash of lightning, you go one, bam, they hit you. Thunder's right there on your, on your nose, wherever. Imagine if that was a missile. Look, they fired that, bang. <laughs> Oh, it's no fair. So it seems like a big danger, these hypersonic missiles. A missile that can travel across the Atlantic Ocean between, say, Berlin and New York. Look at a map, folks. It's a real thing. Between Berlin and New York in about an hour. Don't you wish you could? Man, I'm going to go to Berlin and get a good blend some. Go back to New York where everybody knows what nosh means. Nobody knows what it means anywhere else. I don't get it. I want a little nosh. Where the hell do the words go in our language anyway? And where do they come from? If you research that, you will find a fascinating trove of information that will be far more interesting than daytime television. I promise. However, you, you need to bent for it. And if anybody's bent, it's your old pal Eshkalar. Uh -huh. So anyway. Let's take a scenario. The Rossians have this little anti-carrier fleet out there, let's say, the, the Piotr Valikie. It's a, uh, a Kirov-class cruiser. It's got a nuclear reactor on board. It's there mostly to provide Soviet nuclear uh, uh, doctors with uh, radiated people so they can test their new treatments. I, I mean, no, I mean, it's a warship. It's, it's all very safe. So anyway, you know, trucking uranium across the ocean, uh, what could go wrong? So ask the Thresher, ask the Bukarsk, ask the, <laughs> I'd say the uh, you people. Uh, those who do not read history are doomed to not need glasses because doing this a lot, they wear your eyes out. So anyway, take that Santa, Yana. <laughs> you think you're smart. So this Piotr Veliki and your American carrier task group, because that's what we have, they're kind of like, Let's say they're surging around in the Pacific looking for each other because they're mad. I don't know. Russia cut its uh, price of gasoline down to the point where we can't match it anymore. And all the nations are like, hey, we're going for Russia now. And Russia's like, oh my gosh, they're drinking my blood. But it's the only way to keep them from being America's friends. And now Russia understands capitalism. Okay, well, anyway. In the process of this, say the two superpowers, because Russia is still a superpower when it comes to how many nukes do you have. I don't think how many men are in uniform is nearly as important as how many nukes do you have when it comes to the concept of superpower, right? Okay, so, so Russia is still a superpower. Say Russia and the United States, they go at loggerheads right now, they're having trouble, right? Because one of them says, I want this, the other one says, I want that. 
And these guys say those guys are a bunch of liars, and these guys say those guys are a bunch of liars. And so we can no longer believe anything is true. We just have to go with our side. Understand I'm making sense here. Because you go with the other side, what did that do for you? What did that do for your side? Nothing. And you have to be a member of your side now. Humans divide into factions. It's the dumbest thing ever. It's what keeps apes from controlling their future. All apes, including us. Dividing into factions is the dumbest thing we can do. Oh, now it's us and them. And now it's the Rossian freedom of lifestyle that we want to go back to communism. But we don't say that out loud, but yes, we do sometimes. Good demonstrations all the time. The old commies want it back because they don't remember. They were drunk as skunks and they're still drunk as skunks. They're just shouting whatever they heard on the, you know, on their equivalent of the Rush Limbaugh show. So, spot lies because they get paid to. They read from a teleprompter. Uh, they I'm allowed to talk about this. I'm not allowed to say anything nice about the Democrats. Okay. You don't think that sponsors tell you what you have, can say and don't say on their shows? Then you have a lot to learn about capitalism. This is a good thing. Lesson in capitalism for your old pal Eshkelar, who's been rich, who's been poor, understands it better because the wolves are knocking at his door. Burmese. So, <clears throat> Rossi and the United States of America are at loggerheads and they might go to war. That's the fear, at least, right? You're all feeling it. I'm feeling it. Heck. Where do you want to be when a nuclear exchange takes place? This is a good question. I already have the answer because I'm Eshkelar. When a nuclear exchange takes place, you know where you want to be? Somewhere you can go, what was that? Eh, go back to fishing. Now, you don't want to be in a city because that's where the bombs are coming down. You don't want to be out in those giant farms owned by the rich people who are making all the money because that's where the missile silos are. All those people are going to be nuclear waste. All of them. Wait, and you don't think that they're target? Wait, we targeted Russia's super rich yachts. So you don't think they're going to be targeting ours? <laughs> Where did you grow up? So anyway, it's called tit for tat. And it's how nations go at it. And it's how politicians go at it. It's a thing. Tit for tat. Well, you said this, well, that. You know, I'm rubber, you're glue. It bounces off the knee, sticks to you. So, so. Monkeys are never going to control their future. I'm telling you now. Well, I mean apes. We're apes. We're not monkeys. Monkeys are even dumber than we are. At least they... Wait. But at least monkeys get more tail. Ah, oh, see, this is the A material, folks. But I'm back to hypersonic missiles now because unlike Captain Jack Sparrow, I can keep my point. <laughs> Oh, so the two fleets are out there looking for each other. Well, the Russians got satellites up there saying, hey, look, there's an American fleet. And the Americans got satellites up there saying, look, there's a Russian fleet. Well, when we get within 720 miles of each other, the Russians are going to fire their new hypersonic anti-ship carrier killer, carrier test group killer missiles. You know who calls it that? The CIA, because they want more funding. If you had given us more money, we could have told you sooner. No, you couldn't have. You would have done more cocaine. And if you're doing cocaine, you're trading in cocaine. And if you're trading in cocaine, you are part of what's wrong with the world. Stop it right now. This is why Canada's better than you are. Because we don't sink to that level of not caring about our people, letting them die. Because we need the money. That's capitalism. What am I talking about today? Capitalism. What does capitalism do? It abuses the poor. There's no profit made by a capitalist that didn't come from the poor, including yachts. So let's get back to the real story. Though. So the Piotr Veliki has got his several escorts with it, anti-submarine escorts, um, a, another missile cruiser, perhaps a Slava, just for backup. But at any rate, it's fast, it's strong. It's armed with 72 missiles, each one capable of taking out an entire fleet of American ships if it's nuclear armed. And now that the nations are angry at one another, perhaps it is. Because perhaps somewhere some politicians thought, it's only the ocean. It'll be all right. We can get away with it here. Because that level of politician doesn't know their topic. They're thinking like Hitler. It's a truth. So Hitler was an autodidact, which meant there were vast gaps in his knowledge base. Yeah. Why do you think I'm not a scientist somewhere? Yeah. 
Well, because it would want to be. Too much pressure. Too much pressure! I feel like tweak. Anyway. They launch and we launch. And we've got excellent missiles. Uh, whatever our equivalent is to the Tomahawk T Lamb or, or uh, the Tomahawk Marine version or the Harpoons, the more advanced Harpoons. I think we're, we've got a new, new generation of missiles coming in, which, which your old pal Escort isn't really up on. So. But the equivalent of a Harpoon or a Tomahawk is like headed for those Soviet uh, ships at about Mach 1. Okay, we're about a thousand miles apart, let's say, right? The satellites are following. And we know when we get within 720 miles, we're in range. So if they keep coming at us, they're going to run into range before our missiles drop. So we fire from a thousand miles because we're smart. <laughs> oh, America. So our missiles are going, they're headed for the Russian fleet. And the Russian fleet is like, okay, Americans and... Uh, 780 miles, 770 miles, sir, there are missiles coming, 760 miles, 700, sir, the missiles are going to be here in about 20 minutes. Oh, really? Well, let's see, 700, 750 miles, fire those uh, hypermock missiles, they're going to reach them in two minutes. This is what the story is. They know where we are because of their satellite imagery. We know where they are because of our satellite imagery. It's the most accurate location possible. We know their GPS location. We can send an Uber to their captain's bedroom just on the data from the satellites. And they can do it to us too. And their Uber stinks and there's puke on the floor and chewing gum under the seats. So you're not going to want to ride on their Uber. And here it comes at you at Mach 5. So. Your missiles are going to take about, you know, 20 minutes to get there. Their missiles are coming five times that fast. What does that mean? Five minutes at the most. Probably more like two minutes because they're going hyper mock. Speed of sound 750 miles an hour at sea level. That's where we are. And you figure you're, uh, well, seven miles away, right? Seven times, or seven into. Uh, that uh, that speed. So, so five times hypermock uh, per hour is 35, 3,750 miles an hour is how fast those missiles are going. Oh, that's fast. Which means they can cross the Atlantic in an hour. Which means they can cross the distance between you and them in about two minutes. Whereas your missiles are going to take 20 minutes. Or I say, let's say 10 minutes. Because really, their missiles are five times as fast. I shouldn't be so airy with my numbers. But still, you get the idea. Our missiles are going to reach them in about 10 minutes. A little bit less because they're coming at us. Their missiles are going to reach us in two minutes. Wow. So as soon as we see the launch, our satellites see the launch, the data comes up, the data comes down, we integrate. General quarters is sounded. Well, it's already been sounded. But all your men are on station, your best men are on station, your work center supervisors, your chiefs. They're all awake. They're all as sober as they can be. I'm not naming names or pointing fingers. And uh, they're ready. They're ready as hell. All your anti-aircraft defenses are up. All your defenses are up. Your standard SAMs go Mach 3.5, so they're pretty fast. But they're doing this, and a missile going this way. And this is a very narrow window of opportunity. It's easy to miss. At the speeds we're talking, Mach 5 versus Mach 3, that's Mach 8 fraction of a second. Smaller, perhaps, than a good computer can manage. We'll find out when it happens. I'm just interested in the complexity of this moment. And during this moment, their missiles are being operated by a very advanced computer system. Everything's being taken care of automatically because it's happening faster than a human being can react. You know this, right? Okay. And satellite uplink, downlink at the speed of light still takes time. There is what you would call lag, 133 millisecond lag, 30 milliseconds of lag lag. In other words, turn left 30 milliseconds, I turned left. That doesn't seem like much, but when you're traveling at a collective Mach 8, it means a lot. It can be this, it can be that. So, their missiles are going to hit us in two minutes. And I mean, the United States defends Canada, so I'm a lot to say us. So anyway, Canada defends the United States, you probably don't know about that, but uh, it's true, really. We are such a linchpin in your strategic defense that you should be nice to us all the time. And buy more export A's. If you're going to be stupid enough to smoke cigarettes, buy export A's 
You support Canada. You support Escobar's hometown. And I'm not going to tell you where that is. Because then you go there, and then all the prices that go up because the tourists are there, and then I can't get skunk cheap anymore. Inca filtered skunk, you know how much money that stuff costs up in Canada? Oh, man. So, anyway. You say, that's okay, pal. I'd say, I'm not your pal, buddy. You'd say, I'm not your buddy, friend. And I'd say, what's the next one? Oh, yeah, I'm not your friend, buddy, pal. Whatever. But you get the point. Factionalism. So, your system is going to react in a very short time, and the, the tolerances of this moment are so fine that even computers aren't really adequate for them. And light-speed communications are just a hair slow. How about that? Huh? This is real stuff. So, now your missiles just launched. Their missiles are streaking in on the way. Everybody's hoping, we're hoping that our missiles strike their missiles and that our other missiles hit them. And they're hoping that their missiles strike us and that their other missiles knock down our anti-aircraft missiles or hit our other ships or whatever. You see what I mean? Or defend them against our missiles coming in. All right. And, uh, and RustNet has to update. Ding, everything goes down. It's only for an instant. You know, three seconds, RustNet updates. Da ding, you're back up. Well, your missiles are now, <laughs> whatever they were doing, wee, flying all over the sky. They had no input for like a quarter of a second, a, a half a second, a second, right? Like we got, we got Microsoft Update needs to restart your PC. Go away, just the, just the responding to that takes time that you didn't have. Go away. System restart in 10 seconds. Go away, what the fuck? Boom, you're dead. See what I mean? Now, we're gonna go another moment. Remember I said how fast those missiles were? And when the missiles going at each other, the collective chance of missing one another is very high, very high. And one of the reasons why you have multiplicity of missiles rather than detailing a single missile to each target because you can't guarantee the targets closing at that rate will be successfully intercepted or successfully avoid or evade interception. Yeah, it's a crapshoot. Boom, I roll a seven. Crap, my missiles fall in the ocean. Uh-oh, here come theirs. So this is the deal. In the middle of this, your computer wants to update because it doesn't care if you're at war. In the middle of this, their Skynet goes down for a few seconds, an instant, something happens. And the missiles are now doing this through the sky. Da -da 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 -da. Boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? So nothing happens or the ships that didn't get out of the way all get destroyed because their missile the other guy's missiles kept coming on straight and they didn't try to avoid them or both ships are like okay his missiles are coming my missiles are gone i'm going this way he's going this way and then the computers go down and the missiles are like no longer relevant i mean they make a pretty noise and flash and if you think we're running out of food on earth I wonder how many fish are going to get killed but still the point being as a matter of fact Ask yourselves just for a moment how many fish were killed by the depth charging of submarines in World War II because they cast 100 depth charges or 200 depth charges or 300 depth charges, 250 to 500 pound explosive devices, right? For each enemy submarine damaged. How many fish was that? And then our population ballooned and the fish population went down. And now those nations that survive on fish are fighting each other for those valuable waters off the coast of China, off the coast of Burma, off the coast of Thailand, off the coast of Taiwan, off the coast of Japan, off the coast of the Philippines, which should be the greatest resort area ever. Why we let our relationships with the PI go to hell, I'll never know. So. And I don't think Manitoba had that much to do with it. Part of what we have to do is learn how to conduct ops in inhospitable operation sense. Isn't that the case? Isn't that what the Arctic exercises are all about? Look at all the things that can go wrong there, too. I know volcanism's worse because of the dust and the acid and all that, but still, you might give it a thought. It would take less money to turn the Philippines into a flowering paradise than it would to stop all those Russian missiles coming in. So let's look at those Russian missiles again. Golly, they're about to hit us. And their Skynet goes down now. We've turned. Now those missiles all streak by us or they'll fall in the water. We'll start doing that dance I was talking about. And our missiles do the same thing. Wow. So having these elaborate computer systems is a lovely idea in essence. But when it comes to practicality, I have a story about the 1960s for you. In the 1960s, we had this thing called television. You probably don't have it anymore. 
because you're all advanced and stuff. But television was important. You had a glass screen inside of which was a vacuum tube, and that vacuum tube would create a beam and receive transmissions from elsewhere along from an antenna, and those transmissions from the antenna would interfere with that beam to create light and dark, light and dark, light and dark, light and dark, and that beam would scan across the screen many times a second. And that ended up looking like a picture moving in space and time. Wow. Wait, that is so cool. So, and someone said, well, you know what? We got these great tanks. We got this M48 Patton, you know, the Patton 5, or whatever, M4885. We got the greatest tank on Earth. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh. We've redeveloped the, the, uh, uh, the turret, and we're going to call it the M60 now. It's still the Patton, but it's no longer an M48 Patton. It's now an M60 Patton. Because Patton's the only guy we know that was enough of a blowhard that we remember his name. Sorry, guys, I'm not a fan. But I also read history. And so my opinion is just as valid as yours. Yeah. Study the history. Uh, study the Pensioners' War. Okay, so anyway. In the 1960s, we thought the next big thing would be a tank that the crew never had to come out of. You never had to open a hatch and look outside because that's sniper country. The enemy, not that it's happening in the real world anywhere, the enemy has these snipers out there waiting for somebody to stick his head out of the turret of a tank or the driver out of his like little hat, his door. Sorry, they're called doors. Bang, 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 right? So you, you'd like to keep your tankies, the guys in the tanks, closed up, it's called buttoned up, keep them closed up and with fresh air, air conditioning, and even if they drive through a poison gas cloud or nuclear radiation zone, there'd be enough filters and stuff on that air conditioning that these guys can function completely well. That's a great idea. So how are you going to see? Well, there are two ways to see. One is you can punch a hole in your armor that goes to a telescope and the guy can look through it and you can see that way, right? Which means bullets can come right in that way, which does happen. I mean. You got six inches of armor across your front, except that piece of glass there. <laughs> People are going to be shooting for it, don't you think? Oh, yeah. So, anyway. But it's very difficult to look out of a tank. This is a very difficult thing to do. And so, what they did was they decided we can answer that by putting television screens inside the tank and putting television cameras outside the tank. So, instead of just having this teeny little thing, your gunner, who's looking through this little thing, it's called a gun sight, <laughs> excuse me, would have these three big panels in front of him, right? And then it controls like this. And you'd see on the left of the gun, on the right of the gun, straight ahead in the gun, these big television screens, so you can just see whatever's going on. That's a wonderful idea. These cameras could be swung even, so you can see behind you. It's the answer. It's the answer we've all been looking for. It's, it's, you know, nothing's ever perfect when you implement it. You know that. Except sex with a little Eshkelar. <laughs> so anyway, what would happen was, televisions have glass screens. Guess what happens when you start banging them around, you guys with phones? What happens? Yeah, drop the phone on the ground, it breaks. What happens when a tank does one of them flying jumps like you see in the movies? Yeah, crash, all them TV screens are gonna break. All over the, all over the gunner. All over the driver. Uh, not all over the TC. He's at the back. He's like, ha, 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 whoops, and then he crashed into something. So that idea was a grand concept, but it was a lousy idea in practice. The cameras weren't good enough. You hit a camp TV camera hard with something, like bounce it on a you know a jump or a bouncy road or something enough, it stops working. It starts blinking on you. It starts going crazy because the filaments in the bulbs this is important stuff. Vibrate and break. The metal fatigue happens very quickly with them when you do that to them. Like that. Which is why it took so long for jets to have dependable radars. This is all real stuff. Because jets stuff it like this and they're going fast. It's like crazy. It's like the air is hitting you with a hundred fists of Buddha. If you don't know what the Buddha hand is, then you should learn more martial arts. And then you learn that fighting arts aren't martial arts. They're completely different. That's right. Well, Eshkelar does because there's one thing I don't want to have to do, it's fight. The one thing I do want to do, it's understand why people fight, and that's what the martial arts are, how to move troops, how to, how to supply those troops, how to make sure they don't camp down river of the sewers or the, the latrines, all that stuff. Mail, food, ammunition.
clothing. All these things have to be supplied. Those are the martial arts, the arts of the general, the arts that you will see in the book of uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu and his various disciples and commentators. Commentators? Is that like the one you pull out of the ground? So anyway, the fighting arts, of course, are the punching, kicking, shooting, those arts, those are the fighting arts. Martial arts are the arts of war, not the arts of personal combat. I'm just saying. So I want people to start straightening up on this so that they're experts and other people go like, whoa, no, I thought that you're like, no, the truth is what Eshkelar says because Eshkelar is always right and he never lies. He doesn't make a penny off of any of this. He does this because he loves you and also because he's bored and stoned and needs something to do. I already said that about seniors, you know. So. That's idea of having television cameras in a tank. P.U. The concept is wonderful, but the implementation lacked a lot, like durability. That's why we didn't have dependable infrared systems in uh, World War II. The Germans and the Americans had developed them. The Soviets developed uh, night vision uh, goggles and night vision uh, cameras. Put them, they tested them on a BT-5 tank. There's pictures of it. It's called Dudka, which means pipe. D-U-D-K-A. Look it up, it's a thing. America's, we did inertial navigation, which we studied in the desert, and we also did uh, infrared, which we also implemented in the desert, M3 tanks. Didn't work, but it showed that, it showed the potential was there. That was important. So, again, that brings us to today in hypersonic missiles. We have the exact same thing going on. We have the Soviets, the Russians, sorry, They'll be the Soviets again soon. But anyway, the Russians are shooting, say, 12 of these sandbox missiles and as kitchen missiles, whatever they call them. You have large nuclear warhead missiles that can independently maneuver. They have an AI on board. They have a very advanced computer that interfaces with both the mothership, which has a vastly better collator of data. And they also update from satellite uplinks. And once in a while, one will pop up so over the horizon the mothership can see it and say, hey, they moved. And it's like, oh, okay, and then pop back on it. And you got 12 missiles doing that. One pops up, gets data, turns, the rest turn. One pops up, gets data, turns, the rest turn. That's scary. They're all traveling at, at wave height. They're traveling at, the Russian missiles are traveling at Mach 5. That's 3,750 miles an hour. 3,750 miles an hour. That's, I don't know, 6,000 kilometers per hour. It's very fast. So, they could travel all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. They could travel from Berlin to New York in an hour. So, when you have a fleet and another fleet, they're only 1,000 miles apart. That seems pretty far, doesn't it? That's the range at which aircraft carrier commanders used to think about. Pretty soon I'll be launching my planes. But nowadays, it's the range at which we're going to launch missiles. Now our missiles are going to head out toward them about the same time. Their satellites know, our satellites know, their coordinator back on the ship knows, our coordinators on the ship know, everybody's tuned to a high degree. Nobody's high, speaking of high, nobody's drunk. It's sad, but there it is. Nobody can enjoy themselves during a battle. If you do, you might kill your friends. It's more important to not kill your friends than it is to be high during a battle. I'm looking at you, Russia. If you don't know that yet, stop cooling your airplanes with alcohol. <laughs> so anyway, our missiles are going to reach them in about 10 minutes, say 1,000 miles away, 750 miles away. Reach them in about 10 minutes. Their missiles are going to reach us in two, maybe a minute and a half. Wow. That's not very long, right? So we're already at a hyper alert. We know their missiles are going to come in fast. We're expecting them to come in and we're running all our systems up. We're powering all our defensive systems, our phalanx Sea Whiz and our Sparrowhawk missiles, whatever our new, you know, we have rolling frame missiles, whatever we're going to use for anti missiles. So all this stuff is ready. And we make ready to launch. They've already launched. We're going to launch now. Their missiles are going to be here in a minute. Our missiles are going to be there in about 10 minutes, about 8 minutes now, because they're coming at us, we're coming at them. And uh, 
We don't have much time to react, really. And so we got everything at its highest readiness. All our men trained to the peak. Because, you know, the United States Navy, I've got to admit, I prefer the Canadian Navy, but the United States Navy is the number one Navy ever. There's no Navy that has a better tradition. There's no Navy that has more victories behind it. There's no Navy that has come from behind better, more often, and with great power, strength, and grace to become the greatest Navy on Earth. We are, they are, the shit. So, British Navy, go home. French Navy, go home. Your proud naval traditions, I got nothing against you. But, America, I mean, even I, from Canada, say, gee, huh, yeah. I, wait, I'd like to see Great Britain support 14 Queen Elizabeths. Yeah, instead of two. I'd like to see Japan support 14 Hayugas instead of two. I'd like to see any nation equal the ability to maintain an air force afloat like the United States Navy. There isn't one. There has never been one. Imagine that. You're the best at something. Hands down, never been a better Navy than the United States Navy. Sorry, Air Force. Sorry. Sorry, everybody but Marines. For you Marines out there, your taxi's waiting. So, we got good guys going to defend against them missiles. And them missiles are coming fast, and ours won't be there until later. And as a matter of fact, there's so much by-play, communications going on between the missile streams, that if we're destroyed, our missiles may not be able to finalize their approach to the enemy. And whoever dies, the other guy lives. That's bad, because you want a mutually assured destruction, right? If they get you, well, damn it, I'm going to get them too, right? Last great act of defiance. So, at this instant, when we're launching our interceptors to try to take out their big anti-ship missiles and nuclear tip, and we want to catch them about 50 miles off, we launch ours, and they've already launched theirs, and everybody's are going out, and our big missiles are going farther to get them, and their big missiles are already almost on us, and our little missiles are going out to intercept them, and their little missiles are getting ready to intercept them. The Rossian equivalent of Microsoft says, your computer will restart itself in 30 seconds. Would you like to select a better time for this? And here on our Aegis class cruiser managing the air defenses of the entire carrier task group, we're going to see that same message. Your computer will restart in five, four, three. You're like, no, what the, no, no, you're looking for the click bar. No, no, it's the Russians are like, what the, stoeta, stoeta, he tells Bush kids out, you know. Uh, and uh, that's the problem with the modern system. Things are so heavily computerized, and computers are still fragile compared to the systems that you need to be functional in a military environment. Yes, they've gotten better. Sure, they've gotten better. Now they're talking about and they're starting to display. Multifunction displays, I should have said they're starting to implement. Multifunction displays inside our armored personnel carriers. New tanks, new vehicles, new ideas. Aircraft now have multifunction displays because they have plastic screens now. They don't break as easy. They have solid state technology now. The, the little filaments don't like stress and come apart like they used to. The glass doesn't break. However, a hypersonic missile is being buffeted. Put your hand out the window at 60 miles an hour. You feel that uneven striking of your hand by the air? It's called buffeting, right? Yeah. It's not pretty. That would be Jimmy buffeting. Ha <laughs> ha! That's... Oh, it's an old people joke. Oh, so anyway, at 60 miles an hour, right? But at Hypermach, at 3,750 miles an hour, right? You're going 100 times that fast. And the buffeting is really severe, really severe. And that can shake a missile apart and break it right there. It took us years to get aircraft to be able to travel at the speed of sound because they want to break apart with all that buffeting right at the sonic uh, verge because the pressure cone that builds up is like doing this to the whole plane. It used to be a big deal. Planes trying to go so supersonic would break apart or their controls would block. Called compressibility is a thing. You can look it up. So 
when those missiles are coming in and our missiles are about to go out and our missiles are already in the air going for them and our anti-missiles are about to come out and everybody's ready to like oh I'm gonna win or somebody's gonna win or the world's gonna be made a better place because we destroyed a lot of metal things and poisoned the fish whatever the the intention is uh, suddenly uh, Russian Microsoft wants to restart and uh, American Microsoft wants to restart because this is their handy time. We set the default, right? Restart, default, restart. You know, default, default. Uh, it's 3 p.m. It's 1,500 hours. Uh, three bells, whatever it's, I forget. But still, you get the point. So, and now everybody has to stop and go like, no, don't restart. No, don't, this, you know, please don't restart, Ski. You know what I mean? And that few seconds is going to kill everybody. Or, the systems are going to go down. <laughs> Missiles will be like, what the hell, Ski? You know, trying to find the American fleet. They can't. Their targeting systems have gone down and got to reboot. That reboot takes more than a microsecond. Yeah, it does. So, and in the process, we encounter other problems. Like I said, the buffeting problem. PCs aren't good with buffeting. <laughs> Even solid state can break. The materials they make the substrates out of are subject to harmonic vibration, are subject to harmonic failures. Yeah, it's a thing. And they have to be designed very carefully, and still they're going to go wrong. And so, those 12 missiles, each one's a carrier killer, can take out the whole group if they're within a mile of each other. It's coming in, 200, well, 100 megaton warhead, it's got a czar bomb on it, it's ready to go. It's coming in, and suddenly it's, it, its computer goes down, and as it does that, that's all the time it took to go past the American fleet. And even if it explodes now, even if it self-detonates, it's just going to kill more fish and poison more fish. Remember Oleshkar told you that's all it's going to do is poison more fish. War at sea kills fish. Wait, yeah, it kills people, but the descendants of those people still have to eat. And the number of fish you kill is so significant that the seas are going dry. So anyway, when you start spewing nuclear destruction over things, I think it's going to go quicker. Anyway, so these things can happen in an instant. A missile has any kind of fault, checks on itself. It's got triple redundant computers, you know, to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And the one says, what about this? What about this? And the other one says, I got an update. Give me a sec. <laughs> so anyway, this is the problem with instituting technologies. You'll have a teething period. Not that I would know anything about teeth, but still you get the point. The technologies they're using today for hyper -mock missiles aren't ready. Just like the technologies for rail guns and the technologies for laser weapons and the technology for infinitely maintainable, high rate of fire, uh, independently targetable artillery rounds. All this stuff is still in its infancy. And we can create a laser weapon, a collated beam out of 20 little lasers. And we can play that on a drone for... That drone's made to explode as soon as it can, because that's how you get funding. 10 seconds. Oh, there it is. We got it. 12 seconds on that thing. Okay, and it started to burn. And it was made to burn. It was made to let that laser get it. All right. Let's think about what that means against the hyper mock missile, where you don't have 10 seconds. You don't have 10 seconds. You don't even have a second. From the time you're in range of that laser, it's less than a second till that missile's in the middle of your hold, deciding if it's got enough speed or if its computers are functioning well enough for it to detonate. And if it detonates, it's going to make a lot of overpressure inside all those closed spaces inside the ship. That's going to kill a lot of sailors damage a lot of valuable equipment. Sailors are more important. I like sailors more than I like equipment. No offense, but I would rather have a female sailor interested in me than all the weapon systems in the world. Understand, there are levels of things. So, hypermock technology is not ready. We're not ready for an aircraft. We've been testing it, they break, they fall apart. Their control systems fail, look up, American hypersonic aircraft. Yeah, it's a thing. We've been testing it for years. Canada knows because we receive the drones like psh, they crash into the snow. 
we pick up the pieces, we take it to the local reclamation shop, we sell the platinum, we sell the gold. You know, I mean, who wouldn't, right? It's like trappers. I don't know if you guys understand what it's like in the snow country, but you got these people called trappers out there that want to make a lot of money off the food that you need to eat, but they don't want to eat it. They just want to kill all those animals and take their skins and sell the skins to rich folks. But I wanted that meat. They're destroying the economy. They're destroying, destroying the ecology to personally profit. And so we have up in the Yukon a thing we call bush meat. And bush meat isn't something you pot from your window because all the animals near your house know you'll shoot them and eat them. They learn that. They stop coming around. It's like, why would you pick firewood from near your house? You walk away an hour, grab firewood there and come back. So that when you finally get old, you don't want to walk very far, there's still firewood all around your house. Don't you get this stuff, people? Come on now. Same thing with game. You hunt out there. So that the game around your house is always fearless in case you go into drought sometime, you really need the food. It's a thing. Why do you think that old guy up in Canada feeds raccoons? It makes them good eating. So anyway, my point is that this technology is untried. That the trying of it is going to create these impossible situations for the technology and the computers that manage that technology. Because it all has to be done faster than humans can think or react. It isn't Chuck Norris, Texas Ranger, and he never misses. It's the real world where bullets fly everywhere, even if you want them to hit the perp. Yeah, it's a thing. So that's something you might consider. We're all scared of the Rossi and hypersonic missiles, and they're, they're formidable. If you stay in one place, then they can find you. And if nothing goes wrong with their PCs, because something will. And if we're not blanketing their satellites for updating information, and they don't get it. And so they shoot from where we were instead of where we are. So I wouldn't be so worried about the Russian hypersonic missiles. The only hypersonic missile I'd be worried about is the re-entry vehicle coming off a ballistic missile that's got all those nukes on it that's headed for your cities. And if that happens, you're going to want to be somewhere where you can say, what was that? And go back to fishing. I'm Eshkelar. It's not that I know everything. It's just that I know so much. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you got to do a lot of skunk. <laughs>